Yes. Great. And can you see as soon as it loads this presentation? Is that loaded? Excellent. Yes. Okay, I can can yes. see you nodding, Laura. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Laura. Uh, Neve. Um, so I'm Ben. I'm a PhD student under Will Cawthorn in the Centre for Cardiovascular Sciences, and I kind of co-drive the Edinburgh Open Research Initiative. And I'm just going to give a kind of brief, overarching overview of open research in general. <clears throat> So science kind of science works by exchanging ideas and building on them. And this diagram is just the kind of gold standard in science where there's a full exchange of ideas and information with questions and experiments as best informed as they could possibly be. And the method that, the method that we use for this is journals and they're now supported by the Internet. But there's a lot of downsides and room for improvement to, for, for this method. One being how costly it is both to publish papers and to access them. Another being publication bias, where results that are statistically significant are more likely to be published, distorting the literature so that it's not really a representation of what's ontologically true. Um, a further being data hoarding, where groups can sit on top of data for years so that they can publish in a higher impact factor journal. Uh, and there's a, a lot of other problems as well. But as a result, the, our exchange of information is hindered a little bit by this, and our work is less informed than it could actually be. Uh, and this is kind of termed closed science at the moment, where knowledge or data is unavailable or unaffordable to a lot of people. Open research, on the other hand, it's it's the umbrella term for the best practices trying to make knowledge and data freely available to anyone who wants them. It makes science more reproducible and transparent and more accessible. And there are a lot of things in there, so I, I couldn't quite go over everything today, um, but I just thought I'd touch on these kind of key issues uh, that's useful to keep in mind when we're thinking about open research. I also unfortunately interchangeably say open science and open research sometimes. I do mean open research. I just say open science because I'm in kind of bioscience myself, but I do mean open research. Um, additionally, Laura's put together this pipeline picture for stages of research that open research practices could apply to. Um, I'll be using this just in the top hand corner of the screen. I think you can see my mouse wiggling over it. Uh, what I'll be doing is putting up here where the various things I mentioned apply in this pipeline. Um, but this is a picture that we're going to develop. The idea being that at some point in the future, you'll have like an A4 sheet where you can look at all these different elements and be able to say, right, I'm at this stage, for example. These are the things that I could do that are open science. Um, it's also important to say that open science is not all or nothing, and it's much better to pick one or two things to start to get a grips with than it is to just leave things as the way they are. So if, if it's only one thing that you take away from today, that's still so much better than, than just taking away nothing. So to start with, a, a lot of people make the assumption that if a paper's in a high impact factor journal, that it's automatically going to be a good or a valid paper. But some papers in high impact factor journals are just utter garbage and they can't be trusted. So this, this is a formula for impact factors. It's just the number of citations over the last two years divided by the number of publications over the last two years in a given journal. And they were made in the mid 70s to help librarians pick which journals to purchase. And they were never meant to be a proxy for quality of research. And further complicating it, things like commentaries and editorials on news features, they count towards the citation counts, but they don't count towards the publication counts. So they're, they're, they're gained a little bit by journals, and it's just a lot of the journals hide their data. They won't publish the data that they actually use for impact factors. It's a really shadowy game, and it's just not really acceptable in science to, to not show your data and yet kind of establish uh, and assert a conclusion. Um, but so uh, Peter Lawrence kind of saw this and uh, analogized it like this, which I quite agree with, that it's like if you if you say the quality of a song based on which radio station it's played in the first two weeks after release. But like the problem with that is you just end up producing really junky music that kind of produce music that isn't necessarily in and of itself good, but it just games the system a little bit, which actually I think we kind of see in music nowadays as well. Um, but Additionally, you get things like peak citations to nature papers usually occur two or three years after publication, but in lots of other journals and in especially different disciplines, citations can take a lot more time to accrue. And that doesn't mean that a paper that's published in a different journal, it doesn't mean that it's of less quality because it's taken more time to accrue citations. Further, well, furthermore from this, the citations that are involved in the impact factor equation, they're not evenly spread within journals. In Nature, for example, there's a vanishingly small percentage of papers which contribute to the high impact factor. 
uh, the, the high numerator, I should say. Um, the statistics are skewed and it makes up for the fact that the majority of papers don't go on to be so highly cited. And there's clearly a big spread on how influential a paper can be within a high impact factor journal or any journal. Adding to it, journals can retract papers if there's issues which call into finding their questions. And there's a really strong positive correlation between impact factor and retraction rate. And there's a question of whether this is because the high impact factor journals might have low quality science or if it's just because they're scrutinized more because they're more they're read more frequently. And as a result, people are more likely to respond to issues which could result in retractions. So this work kind of gave me a bit of an answer to this that I could I could start to agree with. Um, these researchers ranked the quality of protein crystal structures in various journals. And what they found was that the higher impact factor journals have lower quality crystal structures. And this would kind of indicate that the science in these higher impact factor journals might actually be poorer. And we also see this with things like statistics, where you, unbelievably you see papers published in high impact factor journals with an N of three. And you just think, I can't believe any of that. Um, on that note, actually, if anyone knows of a paper with where it's appropriateness of statistics ranked by impact factor, please let me know because I'm quite interested in having a read of that. Um, otherwise, I, you just kind of see it anecdotally. <clears throat> so still, even if some of the data in these papers are a bit shaky, it might just be that better papers are published in higher impact factor journals, which could explain their higher citations. Right? Like, well, I mean, there is a way of testing that accidentally. We've kind of accidentally tested that by publishing this same paper across multiple journals. So this paper was published, uh, I think, 10, 15 years ago in eight different journals at the same time. But what you could see is that, lo and behold, the paper that was published in the Higher Impact Factor journal got more citations despite being exactly the same paper. It was exactly the same work, but it was cited more often because of wh where it was published. And um, in confirmation, another team found 4,500 papers which were published in two journals. What they found was that once again, the identical papers garnered more citations when they were published in higher impact factor journals. So it's not just the quality of the paper, but where it's published, which seems to influence it. There's a, a further, yeah, there's a further little uh, complication with citations, and that's how many of them are actually appropriate. So before the internet and support for referencing, citations had to be entered by hand, which meant that you could kind of accidentally when you enter the data incorrectly. So they, this team, they this, these two guys, they made a network from how these citations were mistyped and then how subsequent mis, uh, uh, citations were mistyped, etc. And they developed and tested this model, which they mapped back to the data. And they revealed that about 70 to 90% of scientific citations are just copied from the lists of other references in other papers. So for these, the original paper wasn't read and references were just harvested from subsequent papers, which I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have kind of experienced that. One of one of the girls who works in the office just down from me, the very first citation on the paper she ever published was a wrong citation where it just didn't understand what she was trying to say. And it used her to use her work to argue falsely. Um, this paper might be quite a strong example of it. This has racked up 1,374 citations, and I checked. But the paper was retracted 13 years ago, and 83% of the citations have come after it's been retracted. And just so much as looking at the paper, just, just so much as Googling it and clicking on it, let alone even reading it, would have made it abundantly clear that it shouldn't be cited. But these are just people that have just haven't actually done that which kind of emphasizes a point from before. And as one kind of final example for the citation counts, these are two papers that were published by my PI, Will Cawthorn, in his postdoc. The citations themselves were as of a few months ago, but the absolute values are uh, the important part. The first paper was a little bit less detailed, but was in a larger popular field. And the second paper had a more detailed mechanism, but it was a much more niche field. And clearly the, having more people working in your area in which you've published, you just have a higher chance of being cited for your work because there's more people that have the opportunity to cite you. That's not to say that any one work, any one kind of body of work is better or worse than another because it's been cited more. There's so many factors that go into it. So to, to fix all of these, what can we do? The most, the absolute most important thing when we're looking at work is just judge the quality of the work itself instead of using simple proxies for how good the work is. Not just impact factors or citation counts, but things like the H-index as well. They're well-meaning, but they are proxies for work. 
So Edinburgh signed up to DORA, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, which says that we'll do just that, that we'll, we'll assess the work for itself and not just use kind of weird proxies. So that's the best thing that we could do. Um, additionally, putting work on open access journals and repositories gives everyone access to it and it allows scrutiny of that work and underlying data so that it can be properly judged. There's nothing more frustrating, as I'm sure everyone knows, when you see something really interesting in a paper and you try and find the underlying data and it's just not available. And it just means that you can't necessarily trust the work. So. Thankfully, this is changing and Edinburgh is really keen to change this and there's various initiatives that are going on. But before that, like just look at this email that was sent by Malcolm McLeod last year. It's a circular he got from a colleague. Just take a second to, to read it. It's just ridiculous. It doesn't say anything about the quality of the work itself. I mean, a, a lot of the closed culture of science comes from within institutions perpetuated, especially by professors and PIs who they're very established in their career and from their experience, they know that this is how you, you navigate a field or this is how you navigate your career. It, it came about because of the framework for funding in which work published in higher impact factor journals, oh, in higher impact factor journals would yield more funding than work published in, in lower or mid impact factor journals. Despite, as we know, a high impact factor doesn't mean that work is good at all. As I say, this is thankfully changing and Edinburgh Re Reproducibility uh, is one of the kind of the grassroots organisations that's doing this. There's lots of initiatives that are going around the college, um, but Reproducibility is, of course, the, the one that we're here for today. Um, th there's just lots of people dotted around who really care about changing this. And this is a chance for us all together to, to come together and talk about shifting this and kind of learn a little bit from each other. So science is a bit of is in a bit of crisis of replicatability at the moment. So uh, there was a survey a few years ago now that found that 70% of researchers have been unable to replicate the work of another scientist, but 50% have been unable to replicate their own work as well. Like adding to this, Amgen a few years ago tried to replicate some of their own cancer biology research and they were only able to reproduce six of the 53 papers that they selected, which is about 10%. And it's really difficult to pin down specific reasons for this, but one potential reason I think is illustrated well in this example, although it's not the only reason. And this is my favorite paper, which I think some of you must have come across before. This work took a dead frozen salmon and put it in an fMRI and showed it photographs of socially inclusive and socially exclusive situations. And they saw a statistically they saw statistically significant activity in the brains of these salmons, depending on the situation, which is ridiculous because they're dead and frozen. So they've even made these this fantastic new discovery about post mortem cognition. All the statistics were a little bit off. Like statistics, obviously, are a bit of a minefield, and they kind of deserve dedicated time to understand how they're used properly. But um, putting that to a side for a second and further to that, what we can do is we can use electronic lab notebooks where we can keep really detailed descriptions of what we do so that we or anyone that we share them with can keep de uh, can look back and piece together exactly what happened during these experiments. And further, we can produce thorough and detailed protocols and keep them online in repositories as many people already are. And Edinburgh is trialing protocols.io for these. Uh, which we can just access whenever we like. And additionally, we've got a subscription to the Journal of Visualized Experiments, Jove, which uses video guides to explain kind of precisely how to follow protocols. The, the, one of the benefits for using the online systems is, of course, that you're not limited by space. You don't have to keep lots of lab books all over the place. And really helpfully, especially in COVID time, you can't accidentally lock it in an office when you're working from home. Um, I will just add a caveat that just because you're not able to reproduce someone's work doesn't necessarily mean there's something wrong with the work itself. Like if I gave you five paint colours in this picture, could you reproduce Van Gogh's Starry Night? And like, you know, additionally, if I gave you a Dave Chappelle script, could you reproduce his comedy precisely the same way as he does? Or if I gave you, you know, Mary Berry's recipes and some ingredients. Like studies which report positive results, i.e. statistically significant results, are much more likely to be published in studies which report negative results or statistically insignificant results. But this incentivizes a really poor design and also incentivizes ignoring inconvenient data which doesn't support the story of a paper. And it, it just ends up giving this unrepresentative view of the and so the truth of the collective body of work. It's really bad because as, as long as your question is valid and as long as the methods are appropriate, 
it doesn't matter if the results are negative. It, it shouldn't be about whether results are positive or negative, but it should be about whether they're conclusive. If you've managed to conclusively show your hypothesis is not the case, that's still valuable data and valuable information. So a great way around this is to use registered reports, which are a growing number of, of journals are doing now. So effectively, you describe your research question and your methods beforehand, before you even begin anything. Uh, those methods and questions are peer reviewed, and if appropriate, the results are agreed to be published regardless of the outcome, whether they're kind of positive or negative. And this has been done in psychology for a little while now, and they've seen their positive results published from about 95% of publications dropped to about 50% which kind of makes a bit of sense because otherwise if it's still 90% of publications are positive it gives you this idea that researchers are right 95% of the time which is obviously just ridiculous um, and these negative results are valuable data which have been peer reviewed beforehand and otherwise they might likely never have been published and never have been shared it's also got two added bonuses of, of, of added bonus of stopping these two phenomena p hacking and harking so in p-hacking, scientists get data and you can then end up running through a number of statistical tests until one of them produces a significant p-value, even though it's very likely not an appropriate test for the data, which means that the numbers are completely meaningless. You've just ended up with, a, with an asterisk and people end up happy with that. Um, harking stands for hypothesizing after results are known, in which scientists see the data they've collected and retrospectively change their hypotheses to be in line with the data that they've collected. And both of these are really poor practice, but uh, practices, but researchers do this all the time while persuading themselves that it's okay. Um, and I, I know that I've done it previously in, in the master's project and I've taken it to my supervisor who kind of explained it to me and said, like, it really is important to, to be quite strict with these things with yourself. Um, thankfully in registered reports, you say what statistics you're planning to do in advance and what your hypothesis is or are, which save you from making these mistakes retrospectively. And of course, you can deviate from your plan if it's justified uh, and you just need to give a description of that justification, why you've deviated from it so that everyone can understand why, especially in the light of, you know, different information that you collect or if you don't realise that you've got an extra variable. People understand that, but you just need to say that that's the case. So we can use registered reports so that our work is robust and dependable, and we've got to use statistics that are appropriate for the questions and the methodology we use. And it's just often, it's just not as simple as doing t-tests over and over and over again. Um, also, like the, the P of less than 0 0.05 value should not be seen as some kind of golden threshold to reach. We should actually look into stats and what they're actually telling us. Like p-value should be seen more fluid, uh, fluidly, and this is beginning to change, thankfully, and, and Bayesian hypothesis testing might be a good alternative to p-values, but we'll just have to see where the field goes, because we haven't, I, I don't think statisticians have kind of nailed down a direction. Um, just having a look at this tweet illustrated it quite well for me. The idea that we treat a p-value of 0 0.049 closer to 0 0.01 than 0 0.051 is just ridiculous. And lastly, on this point, a reminder that by definition, just because P is less than 0 0.05 doesn't mean that a finding is ontologically true. It's just all probabilities. So this is a, a diagram kind of underlying how the, the stages of publishing a paper and how that information becomes available. So what you get down here is you've created a manuscript and then it goes through n number of journals before finally your work is published and released and it can be informative. But during that whole time, your work is locked away and no one else can benefit from it. So we have the option of preprint servers, which they make work available immediately. They're places that you can put manuscripts online before they're accepted and published, during which time you can get feedback from the community at large. And helpfully, papers which are hosted here get more exposure, more Twitter mentions and more citations than others. So if you want people to look at your work, they're definitely worth using. And it's important because this last step, stage of this step, takes an average of 146 days from submission until publication, which means all that time that your work is just completely locked away. That also doesn't take into account the previous few steps, and it doesn't take into account rejections with intention to or invitation to resubmit, which is really poor practice that I think should be banned. Um, so again, just one word of warning here, though, just because a manuscript is on a preprint server doesn't mean that it's any good. Uh, again, like we said in Dora, just assess the work yourself. And an example is this infamous hydroxychloroquine COVID paper. So I could, you know, assess what you read carefully. 
So in the dying few minutes, quick fire mentions, the UKRN.org stroke primers. UKRN is a United Kingdom reproducibility network. Um, UKRN.org slash primers, little short overview of some open research topics, really useful to jump into. Plan S is coming in 2021, so research from publicly funded grants needs to be published in open access journals. The rainbow of open science practices can be found online just by Googling it. It lists some really good open research practices throughout the research workflow from kind of start to end. Um, credit taxonomy for manuscript authorship is likely a much better system for attributing credit than order of author name for a number of reasons. The current system is, is really subjective. It's often determined by lab politics or seniority, and it's just open to abuse. But credit gives cr the credit system gives credit based on contribution and leads to fewer authorship disputes. Uh, additionally, Google Scholar is the best, is the most well-connected citation database. And if you're looking for cited work, cite, cited work, that's where you should navigate through. Um, believe me, there is a lot more to be said. But um, for today, thank you so much for listening. Great, thanks very much for that, Ben. Um, I, 